下面我们有请欧盟委员会主席洛泽·曼努列尔·包祖阁下，让我们以热烈的掌声感谢他的支持，请。Mr. President of the University of International Business and Economic, Beijing, the Governor, distinguished guests, teachers, dear students, it is a great pleasure for me to share with you uh, some thoughts on the Euro and the future of Europe. It's always a great pleasure to be back to the University. This time, I'm not coming for an exam. <laughs> but I believe that somehow the Euro and the European Union is in examination now. That's why I want to tell you that we'll get out of this examination with a very strong note. At a time where particularly all the world is discussing much about the European Union, I will propose that we look first at this past to better understand its future. So let me start by recalling that the idea of European integration grew from the victory of peace over war and the triumph of democracy and respect for human dignity over oppression following two major conflicts in the first half of the 20th century. These were the very basic roots that lie at the heart of the beginning of the European Union integration. So the European Union integration is a process for peace. And the founding fathers had the idea to achieve peace through a reinforced economic integration. But the goal is peace. The process is political. By 1958, besides common institutions, <laughs> Europe had created also a customs union. And by 1993, a single market allowing the free movement of goods, services, people and capital. The euro was introduced in 2002 and is currently the currency of 17 of the EU member states. So all the member states share the same internal market, but 17 countries share the same currency. That's why we have a monetary union. And most of those countries that are not yet in the euro will join because only two have an opt-out. And now, over 55 years after its foundation, the European Union, or European Community, as was its name then, is a place of lasting peace and prosperity. It has grown from the six original members to 27 member states, soon 28, with the accession of Croatia. And we have been creating the world's largest single market by value of over 500 million people, accounting for around 20% of global GDP. All over these years, we have been a unique experience of successful cross-border, supranational cooperation. It is more than international cooperation. International cooperation is, of course, relations between uh, states. Supranational cooperation means also, apart from the cooperation, common institutions, common laws, common powers, and the respect of the, these laws and these powers and these institutions by the sovereign member states. So it's a unique construct the European Union as an uh, international but also a supranational entity, for instance, with a common currency. And the establishment of the euro has precisely been one of our most significant achievements, a great expression of Europe's political will and determination. The euro is now part of millions of people's daily life and it has become the world's second reserve currency. In fact, the euro is much more than a currency. It is the most visible symbol of European economic and political integration. And let's be clear, the future of the euro and the future of the European integration are inseparable. 
And this is not only the opinion of the European Commission, that of course, as a supranational institution, as a great country that it is. This is the opinion, and I want you to know, of the leaders of all our uh, governments in the Euro area. They have made it very clear. The Euro story is indeed a remarkable story. The Euro has boosted international, internal cross-border trade and external trade. The Euro has given us lower exchange rate risks, offers one-stop access to our markets, and has proven a powerful catalyst for financial market integration. And above all, the Euro has brought price stability through the independent action of the European Central Bank. At the most practical level, the Euro helps consumers to make better decisions, for example, by allowing easy price comparisons when traveling or when shopping online. The Euro area is a club that more EU member states want to join and will be able to do it once they have met some economic convergence criteria. But the EU and European policies in general have not been beneficially only for Europeans. Since its creation, it has also brought many benefits to our international partners. And China is very well placed to fully appreciate that, as the European Union is your largest trading partner with business worth more than 1 billion euros taking place each day. However, despite the benefits the single currency has brought, the euro area has in recent times been subject to severe strains. In fact, to fully exploit the benefits of the euro, we depend on sound economic policies, in particular, sound budgetary policies. Incomplete governance and surveillance arrangements in the euro area have allowed imbalances and divergences in competitiveness. In this regard, the sovereign debt crisis has been a start wake-up call to all of us in Europe. But the European Union has been reacting and is acting decisively. We have taken important decisions to tackle the question of sovereign debt and strengthen economic governance in the eurozone to improve financial supervision, to stabilize public finances, to implement the necessary structural reforms, and to enhance our competitiveness. Let me recall some aspects. We have, for instance, constituted significant firewalls to the combined tune of 500 billion euros, the EFSF and the FSM, which are now being used already to give financial assistance uh, to some member states. From July on, the permanent crisis resolution mechanism, the European stability mechanism, will be enforced. This is completely new. And this uh, is important to understand, because when the euro was created, when we created the monetary union, we did not have this kind of instrument. So, in you know, some way, we had an incomplete monetary union. And now we are moving from a monetary union to what is very close to a fiscal union. And I want you to understand this development, because in fact, sometimes people pay more attention to the natural difficulties, because there are difficulties and you are not complacent with our difficulties, and people don't see the trend. And when we are making an analysis, and I'm now speaking to a university, when you make an analysis of a phenomenon, a political or economic, a financial phenomenon, it is critically important to understand the trend. What is the main trend? And the trend in Europe is for further integration, not for fragmentation. And indeed, we have now created instruments that we did not have before. And the difficulty of the operation was, and is, that we are creating these instruments still in the aftermath of the big financial crisis. So you can imagine the magnitude of the task. And this among 17 members of the Eurozone, 27 members of the European Union, each one with his own government and parliaments. It's a huge task, but we are making the right choices. We also have reinforced and strongly the rules for fiscal discipline the so-called Stability and Growth Pact. More recently, in fact, on the 1st of January, 30th of January, there was agreement on a fiscal compact in the form of a new treaty which further fosters 
fiscal rectitude, where 25 out of the 27 member states have accepted in an unprecedented manner more discipline, more convergence, binding their competencies for that purpose. Member states are also implementing hard but necessary budgetary adjustments and structural reforms. Take, for example, the measures taken by the new Italian government. The process of recapitalization of European banks, where needed, is going according to schedule. Finally, and last but not the least, the European Central Bank is taking decisive action through making available to banks liquidity, which is contributing to ease bank funding problems. To sum up, we are creating a sustainable future for the euro and will come through our current difficulties with an even stronger and more united Europe at the end of this process. However, I have the feeling that sometimes external commentators of the markets, they minimize both the far-reaching measures already taken and the complexity of moving forward 27 democracies, each with its own internal accountability system. In my view, what Europe has been doing, in particular in the most recent period, constitutes a basis for investors to regain confidence in Europe. While addressing with determination the euro sovereign debt crisis, we must not lose from sight the need to secure growth and job creation. Indeed, fiscal consolidation must go in hand in hand with a long-term vision of a stable, competitive European economy which delivers sustainable growth and jobs. That is why the European Union set its comprehensive strategic orientation, which we call the EU 2020 strategy. This is our European blueprint to get the economy back on track over the course of the decade, with education, research, innovation as key drivers. We are working hard on getting more people in education, in training, in work, exploiting the full and tapped potential of our internal market and on developing a more entrepreneurial and innovation-friendly environment. I have recently presented concrete proposals to tackle urgently youth unemployment and to boost the competitiveness of our SMEs, small and medium enterprises, including by supporting them to go international, reaping the benefits of globalization. But our economic position is also affected by the persisting imbalances in the global economy. And all leading economies need to contribute to redressing these imbalances. As the Confucian teaching goes, and I quote, within the four seas, all men are brothers. And I believe, indeed, that all men are brothers. Eight years after China released its first policy paper, on relations with the European Union, much has changed. China is now a global force, and so it is especially welcome, and I have strongly welcomed, the Chinese leadership's ambition to rebalance China's growth model in the medium term and in line with the G20 framework for growth. Increased Chinese consumption, like increased economic discipline and convergence in Europe, will be important for delivering sustainable global growth and I welcome the recognition of this in China's 12 five-year plan. In today's strongly interconnected world, most challenges are global. They are global by nature, and they call for global responses. Strong economic global coordination is therefore key for world stability. The G20 is the appropriate forum for such a global coordination. Economies of the EU and China have become ever more closely linked. This has confirmed the need for common analysis and joint actions by the European Union and China, not only in the short term, but also in dealing with the fundamental challenges we both face in the medium term. That is why we say, both the leadership of Europe and the leadership of China, they say this is a strategic partnership. And it's not just a word, strategic. It means that there is a perspective of the medium to the long term in the decisions we take. We need to work ever more closely together on a wide range of issues to make change happen for the better and for the well-being of our citizens and future generations. This is exactly what the EU-China Strategic Partnership is about. This is why I'm very happy with the results of yesterday's summit. Ladies and gentlemen, the students, the European Union, and in particular the Euro area, 
suddenly finds itself at the critical